Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Tuesday morning, September 5th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing all right today. Hope everybody had a good Labor Day yesterday. We had family in, and so I took the day off. Enjoyed my family. I don't typically take too many days off, but I did yesterday. Gail, Lyle, Janie, good to see you guys. If you got any questions or comments while we're going through the stream, put it on the comment section here or on the nearchurches.com Facebook page, wherever you may be watching. And also, we have started recording the audio of these videos and uploading these, uploading these to the Podbean channel so you can listen to it as a podcast. And that is, some people find that easier as opposed to sitting down and watching a video or carrying your phone around and having your screen on all the time. So... All of this stuff is now going to be uploaded to our Podbean channel. Of course, we've got Podbean, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, we started putting our sermons on all of that, too. So, all right, we are ready for Jonah, chapters 1 and 2. We introduced the book last Wednesday. We talked about the historicity of Jonah, the veracity of the book. Okay, these are real characters, real events that took place. And so many people question that, particularly, I think, because of the the miracles that are, that are recorded in this book, and I talked a little bit about that last Wednesday. Seven miracles. <clears throat> and some people question, well, are they all miracles? I think that they are, and I think we can demonstrate that as we go through the text. But anyway, that's what we're doing today, Jonah chapters 1 and 2. We read the first three verses as we introduced the book, but just to refresh ourselves here. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he's going about 2,500 miles in the opposite direction that God told him to go, and it's purely speculative. Uh, speculative as to why he did that. You know, people will have discussions and folks write commentaries on why Jonah didn't go to Nineveh. To me, it's kind of the same discussion of why did G uh, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Okay, the, the text doesn't tell us, so any guesswork on that would be just that. It would be just guesswork. So we're not going to waste our time with all of that. We're just going to get right into the text. So verse 4 records this first miracle that's recorded in the book. So we'll note those as we go throughout. The Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was uh, was about to be broken up. And he, you know, in, so in the beginning, okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you read all of Genesis chapter 1, and you have all of these miracles, the miracle of creation, uh, creation out of nothing by God. But as he's creating those things, on those first six days, he is also setting in order or establishing what we call laws of nature. So the wind blows, and there's nothing miraculous about a breeze. There's nothing miraculous about a gusty wind. But to me, Jonah 1, 4, the Lord sent out a great wind. This is something directly from God. And so this is changing what was happening currently at that time, and there's a specific reason for it. So I do think that this would uh, could properly be characterized as a miracle. Deborah says, I think we can all relate to Jonah. Sometimes it's just hard to do some things, even though we know they need to be done. Yeah, I've heard discipline, the word discipline being defined, you know, being self-disciplined, as doing things that you don't want to do. Doing them even though you don't want to do them. That's the idea of discipline. Hey, good, so good morning, Deborah. Good to see you. And good morning, Miss Louise. So, I, I, again, I do think that this particular wind here is miraculous because it's connected with something that's going on. Well, the mariners were afraid. So that tells me, verse 5, well, this these people, they do their work on water. This is what they do. And so this wind is so... What uh, tempestuous, so strong that the guys who live on water, who've dealt with wind before, are afraid. And um, they each cry out to their God, which 
would indicate to us that these are polytheists. They, they, they do everything they can. They're, oh, they're throwing cargo over the side. They're trying to lighten the ship. Jonah's asleep. And uh, there's been some interesting talk about that. You know, Jesus slept on a ship once during a storm. And, uh, well, Jonah's sleeping on a ship. But this storm is his fault. Anyway, the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. That's kind of a, I know it's not similar, but I think of like the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal, and then the 400 prophets of Jezebel that that uh, Elijah dealt with in the days of Ahab and Jezebel. They, they're crying out to their gods, and then um, the prophet cries out to his god, and well, God answers. You kind of see that same thing here. They're all crying out to their gods. Well, hey, let's give your god a shot. Why don't you cry out to him? Maybe he'll stop it. We're, we're about to perish here. Verse 7 is interesting, and I actually had somebody make a comment. I think it was Wednesday. I don't think it was a private message, but what about lots? What are lots in the Bible? So we're going to talk about that for just a minute. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. Well, then the lot falls upon Jonah. He is identified. So let's talk about the casting of lots for just a minute. What is a lot exactly? Um, hey, good morning, Sheila. Good to see you. Well, it's speculation is it's some kind of a rock or a pebble. Probably has some type of marking on it that indicates an answer. The if you go back and read Joshua chapter eighteen when they are dividing up the promised land, dividing up the inheritance among the tribes, they do it by lot. They cast the lot. Um, in Acts chapter one, the eleven apostles, of course, minus Judas are with about 120 other disciples, and there are a few there who are qualified technically to become an apostle, and so they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. So there's an interesting verse that I think helps us understand. One thing that we can understand about lots is that there's a decision that has to be made, and this is one way that God directed the people to that he would influence the decision. All right, Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The decision of the lot. Okay, whatever, again, what, whether it has a marking on it or it's like flipping a coin, heads or tails, we don't know that precisely. But the decision in the result, the, the casting of the lot, the Proverbs writer says, is from the Lord. And again, we see it uh, several times in Scripture about coming to a decision. And God helps in these decisions. So you have these polytheists casting lots. Obviously, God himself is involved in the decision because the lot fell on Jonah. Well, verse 4, the God sent out a great wind because, verse 3, Jonah's trying to get away from his presence. So God reveals even to these, to these pagans, he's in charge. And, and Jonah's the... Jonah is the cause of all of this. Well, for whose cause has this trouble come upon us? What is your occupation? Where are you from? Your country? Uh, and who are you? You know, what are your people? Well, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And you know, polytheism typically. So I was just reading about Israel's battle with the Assyr uh, with the Syrians. I forget what chapter that's in. It's back in the back in the Kings. But anyway, the the Syrians were saying, well, we were defeated in this location, so let's move to this location. Their God is a God of the hills. Let's go fight in the valley. Maybe our God will be superior in the valley. So you even have this idea of a geographical God. Certain locations is where your God serves or where your God um, is supreme. Hey, good morning, Neil. Good to see you. Well... The God of heaven is the God of sea and dry land. Well, he created it all. He's not limited in his power in any location on earth. And they're going to see that. These mariners are going to see that. So, what have you done? For the men, so this is Jonah 1 and verse 10. For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? for the sea was growing more tempestuous. Well, the, the only solution was, I have to leave the boat. 
He he has to, and that's the thing. He was commissioned to go to Nineveh and preach. He's not excused from that. And obviously you can't escape the presence of the Lord. And so the only solution is I've got to get off this boat. You guys are heading in the wrong direction from where or to where God has called me. And so um, this is kind of interesting. He tells them, I know, verse 12, this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land. They didn't want to have to do that. Okay, again, these guys live on the water. This is where they work. They know what's going to happen if they throw him over, or they think they, they know. He's going to die. And they try to spare his life. Well, no. So they picked him up. They picked up Jonah, verse 15, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. There's miracle number two. Okay, if you were on a boat today, and the water was rough, and the wind was blowing, and you throw somebody overboard who's not doing what they should, <laughs> the it's it's not going to stop the storm's not going to stop immediately so we see that with jesus on a on an occasion uh, in the gospels where the disciples cry and actually on a couple of occasions and jesus simply says peace be still and the storm ceased immediately and you see the same thing here this is not a natural event so it's a miracle it's supernatural then okay upon seeing that they've already communicated to jonah about who he is where he's from and who his god is but upon seeing that, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. <clears throat> now that's interesting to me because, again, these are pagans. These people worship many gods. But when they see the miracles, they, well, offer sacrifice and they, um, they make vows to God. Well, what is, the perp what is the biblically stated purpose of miracles? I think of passages like John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. These are written that you might believe. One of the stated purposes of miracles was to, uh, to produce faith in those who witnessed them. It was to confirm what was being said, which it, it obviously did here too, but it produced faith in those who saw them. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now, what all that involves, we don't know. How far they took this, you know, how long after these events did they maintain their vows? We don't know. So we can't comment on that. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. I think this is miracle number three. Um, there's, there's nothing miraculous about a fish that is large enough to swallow a man. But this one specifically was prepared by God to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So chapter one records for us three miracles and there, so there's four more in the book. Sheila says, when did the power of casting lots stop? Um, well, I'm thinking about that. I'm trying to think of the last occasion where, of course, I think of Acts chapter 1. Hey, good morning, Lottie. Acts chapter 1, the lot was cast for and fell upon Matthias. Well, that's a good question. I w well, question, what I'm thinking about. Sheila, what I would say is it goes, probably it's limited within the miraculous age. Uh, because it's, okay, so if you've got a handful of rocks that are going to make a decision and God is directly involved with that decision, he's going to decide how it falls. And that's how we see it occurring through Scripture. Um, so whenever the miraculous age stopped, God quit communicating in that way. Well, and that's another thing to think about. Um, Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past unto the prophets. Well, various times and various ways. One of the ways that God communicated with man was through lots. But then Hebrews 1, 2 says, He has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. So we have the revealed will of God. We don't need to cast lots anymore. And so as a, I hadn't really thought about that particular question, but as I'm kind of thinking it through right now, that would be my answer. When, when that miraculous age, the variety of manners of communication came to an end with the full revelation of the gospel, that would be the end of that. All right. So the Lord's prepared a fish, miracle number three. Now, all of chapter 2, well, all of chapter 2 except for verse 10 is 
a prayer of Jonah from the belly of the fish. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of, and this is interesting, the, King, the New King James says, Sheol. If, if I'm not mistaken, and if some of you are, if you have your King James on you, the King James may say hell. I'm not sure about that. But whatever the case may be, the New King James says, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. Well, what does this word mean? The basic idea is it's a deep part of the earth. Um, the word is translated a couple of different ways. So if you, read a new, if you read a King James Version Bible, and you're reading through your Old Testament, and you see this word hell in the Old Testament, if you do a little bit of digging, the word is sheol, and it's typically talking about the grave. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, back to Genesis chapter 44. Let me get back there real quick. Uh, Genesis 44 and verse 29. This, and this is the occasion. Joseph, has he's in Egypt. He's sent for his brothers. There's a discussion of who should go. Um, Joseph has asked for the youngest, for Benjamin to come back. Jacob, of course, doesn't want to do that because Jacob had already lost Joseph, his youngest. So anyway, uh, Genesis 44, 29, If you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. And that word is Sheol. And then you have verse 31, It will happen when he sees that this lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. When Jonah says, out of the belly of Sheol I cry, Jonah is signifying, the, the language is signifying that he's been buried. He's been consumed. All right, he, Nobody's going to find him. You think about his perspective in the belly of the fish. Who's going to find him? So I'm out of sight, out of mind, as we say. But God heard him. Uh, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. Your billows and your waves passed over me. Well, he's buried. Not only is he in, a, not only is in, is he in the belly of this great fish, but he's buried under the sea. All right? The water surrounded me, even to my soul. So he goes on in his prayer talking about the, um, well, like verse 6 here, Jonah 2, 6. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. You think about um, mountains and how vast they are, how tall they can be. Um, well, what's under them? They're, they're moored to something. And he, so he's talking, it's like, it's like I'm buried under the mountains. You cannot get any deeper than he was. And yet God brought up his life from the pit, verse 6. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. I've got that part underlined in my Bible, Jonah 2, 7. Think about this. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. But you look back at chapter 1 and verse 3, when he's commissioned to go to Nineveh and preach, he intentionally tries to avoid the Lord's presence. But now that he's in a bad situation, what does he want? He wants God. He wants God to hear him and answer him. And that's, that's not uncommon for, I would say, for us as humans. You know, everything's going well. We, we may not express our dependence upon God as we ought. But as soon as things go bad, boy, we're ready to turn around, and we're ready for God's presence and His help. So, I don't know, I just find that interesting. Uh, my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Well, God is their mercy. He's the only source of mercy. So you have these mariners who are fearful for their lives, crying out to their gods, and there's no answer. And when Jonah cries out to his God and tells them what to do, there's an answer. So, you forsake mercy when you forsake the true God. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Well, there's miracle number four. And particularly there at the end of verse 9, Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. I'm going to do what God's told me to do, is the idea here. Well, again, what God has told him to do was go to Nineveh and preach to that city that they needed to repent. 
there's no escaping our responsibility to God. We can try to hide. Um, we can try to abdicate our responsibility. It's not going to happen. We're, we're still, still going to be held accountable to what God has called us as His people to do. And that's one of the great lessons from Jonah. You cannot escape your responsibility. So one, one thing that's been done with the book of Jonah kind of to help us um, have an image, I guess, in our mind of the book of Jonah. Okay, how do you summarize each chapter? I've heard it like this. Chapter 1, Jonah's running from God. Okay, he went to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. Chapter 2, he runs to God from the belly of the fish. Chapter 3, he runs with God because, well, now that he's been through this experience, he's going to do what God says do. And then chapter 4, I've heard called, he runs ahead of God. He wants God to do more than God was going to do. He wanted Nineveh destroyed, but that's why he was being sent there, so they could repent and not be destroyed. So anyway, uh, from God, to God, with God, ahead of God. It's kind of interesting there. All right, guys, that's what I've got for today. I didn't want to go any further because chapters 3 and 4 have quite a bit to talk about. So we'll stop here for today. Good to see all of you back. I appreciate you being on here. We will come back tomorrow, Lord willing, and finish the book of Jonah. Uh, I don't see any questions or comments beyond what I've already acknowledged. So thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Good to see you back. And hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And we'll finish the book of Jonah. Have a good day.